Hey guys, welcome to Boxing Squared for boxing news and views from around the internet. Post-fight reviews for Carlos Takam vs. Martin Bacoli and also Moses Itoma vs. Isvan Bernath. And we'll start first with the dominating performance from Martin Bacoli, who stops Carlos Takam in the fourth round. And heading into this one, we got a bit of a shock at the way in Martin Bacoli coming in at 299 pounds, easily a career highest. And I looked from a few years ago when Bacoli faced Sergei Kuzman, and he was 50 pounds heavier than that fight. But the explanation for the weight came after the fight, but we'll come to that soon. But it was a couple of pretty, you know, low volume rounds to start. And actually, Carlos Takam landed a few clean right hands in the second round. But Martin Bacoli center of the ring just measuring taking his time and with the extra weight probably a good thing didn't want to sort of burn himself out but he just sort of sprung into life in round three billy nelson told him to let his hands go and that he did he really started to put it on carlos to come and you could see these big looping hooks body and head taking an impact Carlos Takam looking shaken up and then Takam tries to respond as Bacoli sort of uh, you know takes a bit of a breather has him on the ropes and then it's not too long before you know Bacoli starts to actually come back with some shots of his own and so much so that by the end of the round he had Carlos Takam on shaky legs he was throwing these nice short you know uppercuts and short hooks and he was connecting with some and it was taking a toll and at that point you knew Carlos Takam can't take too much more of this because those legs were shaky heading into the fourth round. And unfortunately for him, uh, it was uh, left hooks to the body that really did the damage. And, you know, Carlos Takam does have a good poker face, but the, the first left hook sickening shot that thudded into the body from a very menacing Martin Bacoli who was tracking forward looking for his man, you know, Carlos Takam was badly hurt. Bacoli keeps following up, sinks another left hook in, and then follows up with the right hand. And at this stage, you know, he was trying to cover up everything. He didn't have enough arms to really sort of um, to do that. He looked on shaky legs. He didn't look um, too long for the fight. And the referee said, nah, seen enough, and jumped in. Of course, to calm, he protests, but... I think it was a good stoppage. He was starting to get pretty hurt in there. And at the end of the day, 42 years old, he might be in great shape, but he was getting pieced up in there by Martin Bacoli. So after the fight, Martin Bacoli was asked, who do you want to fight next? And he basically said, well, anyone who's here, but, you know, I'll leave this up to my management, all that sort of stuff. Didn't call anyone out specifically. And I guess that's because he's with Boxer. And this is one of the things with this promotion. And one of the things I'd noted was, well, actually, he's not on the top rank press releases when they send through quotes and comments and photos. Um, all this sort of stuff. He turns up on some of the Queensbury social media, but that's because he's with Boxer. And I guess one of the problems for him now, and we'll come to this in a moment, is the promotional situation. But he was specifically asked about the weight because 299 pounds, you know, that's a lot. It was a lot of excess rubble he didn't need to be carrying, and that's a huge risk fighting at a higher level. Carlos Takam is a good name, you know, for gatekeeper, you know, to put on his resume. But at a higher level, he has to be in better shape. But it was disclosed by both Bacoli and then his trainer, Billy Nelson, that he had a, uh, a back injury. And it was uh, described by Billy Nelson as a severe back injury. And Bacoli said he only spent two weeks in the gym preparing for the fight. But, um, you know, if, if the injury was such you have to ask the question, should they have taken the fight? Should they have risked it? Maybe they're overplaying the injury. I don't know. Maybe we have some issues here with Martin Bacoli's weight that they're trying to disguise with an injury. You have to ask that question because the weight has been ballooning up against Tony Yoka, 275. Last time out, it was in the 280s and now 299. I guess the proof will be in the pudding when the next fight comes around. But he is looking for a big fight. And the fact that he's with Boxer, may prevent that. Remembering, only just signed with him not so long ago, and Igor Shevardutsky was the first fight on that deal. Don't know how many fights he's got with Boxer, but at ringside, Ben Shalom, the Boxer promoter, was there with Martin Bacoli. And for me, it looks like they've got nothing for Martin Bacoli at Boxer, 
for you know any fights for him they're going to have to be paying in guys to come in for, as opponents as it is the matchmaking is already tough enough it's hard for them to get decent fights for Bacoli through his career and he's been building back since that loss to Michael Hunter back in 2018 and with him being a hard puncher who you know doesn't really sort of promote or sell fights can't sell out a phone booth you know some people are like well it's a low reward high risk you know, and I can understand why other fighters are sort of steering clear. He's going to have to get himself into some sort of mandatory position. He just is going to have to, because otherwise he's not going to ever fight for a heavyweight title. He has to go that mandatory route, has to get those eliminators, that sort of thing. So dominating performance by Bacoli, and yeah, he did his job, and I guess against the 42-year-old sort of faded to calm. You know, he did a number on him, but he did a number better than some other guys in more recent times. Obviously, we saw to calm beat Tony Yoka. We saw Makmanov go the distance with to calm not so long ago. So in the context of it, yeah, it's a faded and washed to calm. Still not a terrible version. You know, you still got to give him some credit. Good performance. Now to the second fight that we're going to cover, Moses Itoma versus, uh, versus Istvan Bernath. So this was a fight that was um, a, a fighter with a 10 and one record for Moses Itoma to face. Uh, Bernath had lost to a journeyman, the sole loss on his record. So you knew it was a pretty looking record, but Moses Itoma was going to beat him. It wasn't an over, overmatched opponent. And so it proved. So it was a first round stoppage. Bernath, who, I mean... This is the thing with some of the broadcast commentary. You know, they got waxing lyrical about Itoma, waxing lyrical about the opponent and how he fought Tyson Fury in the amateurs and all that sort of stuff. And it's like, none of that matters. Bernath might have had 200 amateur fights, but that doesn't mean he's a good pro. And the thing is, if he fought Tyson Fury 17 years ago in 2006, and what? Who cares? We knew what it was. It was a guy, you know, a lamb to the slaughter situation. Moses Itoma in the first round blows through him. It was a jab that dropped him. Not too long after, um, as Moses Itoma is setting upon his opponent, just landing shots, wailing away, the referee jumps in because Bernath couldn't defend himself. He looked pretty worse for wear at the time of the stoppage. He didn't go down again, but obviously he was getting wailed on by Itoma. Good performance by Itoma. He did his job. This is the sort of thing he needs to go in there and do. Um, be dominant. Get a highlight reel stoppage. Be exciting. And in the ring there after he dropped him that first time, you know, there was a little bit of bravado from Itoma. And it was good to see that there was some personality because outside of the ring, very circumspect. But he did say, and I'll just go to my notes here, that it's only going to get better. Get your popcorn and Uncle Frank had told him to let his hands go. And he did say he felt the pressure when he was asked about the pressure of fight week, the event, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and also he had some advice from Mike Tyson that not everyone is a bum and you can learn from every fight, including your losses. So, you know, some of the other comments that he made there seems to have a lot of confidence. Uh, there's much was made of this whole trying to break Mike Tyson's record during the broadcast, all that sort of stuff. He's going to have to fight every month. I mean, just fighting every couple of months or every three months isn't going to do it for him. I mean, personally, I think it's more of a gimmick than something that's realistic. And in this day and age, you know, with the money that opponents want, um, the the cards that are available, Frank Warren doesn't have a card every month that he could probably put him on. But we'll see what happens because he needs to be brought along the right way. And as Frank Warren said after the fight, right fights at the right time. It's all about timing. And yeah, they've got to give give him the appropriate seasoning. And at the top of the heavyweight division, we've got such a log jam with contenders wanting shots and all that sort of stuff. How does he slot into that? He do he doesn't at this current time. Even in a year or two, he's on the outside looking in unless he's gifted a title shot by way of being in Frank Warren's stable if Fury or someone else in that stable has a belt that Utoma can fight for. So I guess, you know, got to keep expectations on uh, in check regarding this whole sort of what seems to me to be a gimmick about beating Mike Tyson's record to be a world champion. Uh, maybe it'll end up being for a secondary title and then they'll claim that. Who knows? But he did his job. Moses Utoma rolls on. What do you make of it all? Drop a comment loud and often. Hit like, hit subscribe, follow me on Twitter. Boxing underscore squared. I'm out.